Hi, Sukman, we cannot hear you. You're on mute. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll begin again. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today, uh, August 30th, the International Day of the Disappeared. I wanna begin by acknowledging um, all survivors and families of enforced disappearances in South Asia and throughout the world, uh, and the courageous human rights defenders who are fighting alongside them for truth and justice. Uh, we're also approaching the 25th anniversary of the abduction of a Punjab human rights defender, just once in Kalra, who has been a significant uh, inspiration and influence for our own work at INSAF. Um, it's my privilege to be uh, kicking off Colorado Week with three remarkable thought leaders and human rights defenders from their respective regions. Uh, we have Navkiran Kaur Kalra, um, who will be speaking uh, on behalf of Punjab. We have Imran Mir, who will be representing Kashmir. And we have uh, Ruki Fernando, who will be uh, speaking uh, about Sri Lanka. Uh, my name is Sukhman Dami, and I will be uh, facilitating this conversation. I'll suggest some questions uh, to the panelists. And uh, afterwards, there will be an opportunity to open up uh, the panel uh, for uh, questions from the audience. I'd like to begin this discussion uh, with asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves, their work, uh, and what catalyzed their involvement uh, on the issue of enforced disappearances and the, the larger uh, context uh, uh, that they find themselves in. Um, Navkiran, uh, I'd ask that you, uh, you know, begin uh, the conversation and uh, respond first. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Napkiran, Napkiran Gaur Kalura. Uh, today I'll be uh, representing our mission organization plus the, uh, one of the survivor families uh, from the uh, enforced disappearances uh, that happened in Punjab. Uh, and uh, uh, as, as part of one of the survivor families, we have been involved in, in the legal cases, uh, not just of my father, but uh, other, other enforced disappearances in Punjab. What triggered uh, our activism or our family's involvement is uh, clearly my father's abduction uh, 25 years ago, September 6th, 1995. Uh, before that, we were just a common family uh, busy uh, with uh, schools and working. Uh, my mother was a librarian. But September 6, 1995 kind of changed the trajectory of our uh, entire life. Uh, we were thrown into this. And uh, by that, uh, my father, who was uh, a human rights activist, who actually uh, went to the cremation grounds uh, during the insurgency, during the period of 1984 to 1994, 95, when uh, thousands of uh, uh, disappearances were happening uh, in Punjab, and he collected the uh, list of mass cremations uh, happening within the districts of Amritsar, Tarantan, and Godaspur. And uh, that his work is what uh, triggered our activism, uh, uh, his disappearances, uh, disappearance, and then later on murder kind of uh, made uh, us to continue his work, his legacy. Um, and uh, I mean, his, his work had a very clear agenda. He was only uh, working for the mass commissions and the disappearances, the human rights violation that was happening um, uh, during that time. And uh, it was just to seek the justice for those families whose loved ones had been disappeared uh, and uh, the families who were seeking uh, some kind of uh, acknowledgement, some kind of uh, justice. Uh, that's what we continued till then. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Imran, uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, you know, introduce yourself and uh, speak about your involvement and kind of contextualize it uh, if, if you could. Yeah, thank you, Sukman. Thank you, Nakran. Um, my name is Imran. I'm an attorney and an entrepreneur. Um, part of my work related to Kashmir is through an organization called the Kashmir Law and Justice Project. Um, in terms of the question, essentially for me, this is part of my inheritance, you know, as a Kashmiri. I grew up in the US, but um, the experience of occupation and the violations uh, like what Navkaran family has experienced are common, uh, very quite common in Kashmir. And so I think, you know, when I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the story of Navkaran's family 
And what immediately came to mind for me was a story of a particular person. So uh, kind of for me, spring break, senior year of high school. One of the things that happened was, so late March, 1996, there was a body that uh, washed up in the Jhelum River by Zero Bridge in Srinagar. <clears throat> and this body was bound, the hands were bound, the face was mutilated, it was a gunshot through the head. And that body was the body of a man named Jalil Andrabi. And for those who don't know, Jalil Andrabi, like Navkaran's father, was a prominent human rights defender, in, in this case, from Kashmir. He was, at the time, he was 36 years old. He was a lawyer. He was married. He had three kids. And he had actually gained some prominence because he'd won a landmark judgment in the Jammu Kashmir High Court that basically went to there being some oversight over these torture sites that exist, existed then and exist in Kashmir today. Um, and with some of that attention, he traveled to the US and he went to Geneva and he gave testimony at a meeting of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva in 1995. And so in early March of 1996, he was abducted outside of his home he was sitting in the car with his wife. He was abducted. He was taken. And that's his body that shows up a few weeks later in the Jahan. And, you know, when you think about, we think about disappearance, we think about abduction. We think about what we call extrajudicial execution or killing. These phenomenon are very related. And in the arc of Jila Andrabi's story, to me, is very resonant with the arc of Kal Rasov's story. And you see two men doing similar work in slightly different contexts. They're separated by, you know, Amritsar and Srinagar a few hundred kilometers apart. It's the same state apparatus that's, in, that's working. And, uh, you know, these are people that we know. This is part of our own personal narrative, our personal stories. And so for me, it's, it's you know, part of the inheritance and you sort of, these are the things that you kind of grow up with. And so for me, the engagement is just, you know, trying to find ways to do right by the inheritance that we have. I hope that's responsive. Uh, um, I, I turn to you with the, uh, the same question, if uh, you're able to kind of uh, introduce yourself um, and, um, what catalyzed uh, your uh, involvement uh, with uh, forced disappearances um, in Sri Lanka? Uh, I guess in my case, there was no particular trigger or one incident. It was a gradual process. Uh, no, none of my family members have disappeared. Uh, so I think I became involved in uh, human rights activism through my involvement in some church-based youth group. And uh, as I got more and more involved in uh, meeting uh, survivors of rights violations, uh, families of, uh, of torture, uh, of arbitrary detention, of extrajudicial executions, of uh, displacement, I also met uh, families of disappeared people. Uh, searching for their loved ones and uh, and gradually the number of people number of families of disappeared that i met uh, increased and i kind of got uh, involved in their lives and in their uh, search for their family members in their search for criminal accountability and in their search for reparations so it was a gradual uh, involvement uh, ju just a follow-up question i, I uh you know, excuse me for kind of going off format here and jumping to a question now for, for Ruki. You mentioned that you got involved uh, through uh, a youth program at your church. Was, was the church um, uh, in an organized sense uh, taking up the issues of uh, enforced disappearances similar to what we may have, what we saw in uh, El Salvador during the civil war there? Or was this kind of unique to your uh, local community? Uh, well, I think a significant difference between El Salvador and Sri Lanka is that, uh, in my understanding, El Salvador was predominantly Christian. Uh, in Sri Lanka, Christians are a minority, about uh, seven to eight percent. 
but uh, in that sense, I think the even out of that 7 to 8 percent among Christians, only a very few Christians were actively involved in uh, supporting uh, families of disappeared people. And uh, but there was a few uh, in that. Uh, no, uh, seven to eight uh, percent who were very, very active and very, very sub sympathetic, very, very supportive of uh, families of disappeared people. And there are still a few more. And no, I can give a couple of examples from today uh, uh, because now it's midnight today. Now it's actually 31st early morning. Uh, so I can give examples from what happened today in terms of church involvement. And also we had a few uh, uh, Catholic priest uh, who were subject to appearances. So in a way, you know, the, the churches have been victims, but small active in the search and for criminal accountability. Uh, thank you for elaborating. Um, I, I'd like to next kind of, uh, you know, focus uh, in a little bit of uh, greater detail on uh, activities uh, specifically that uh, survivors and families of enforced, enforced disappearances uh, have been engaging in in each of your respective regions. Um, I know you each work closely uh, with these issues and with these families. Um, uh, Ruki, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of uh, start with you this time. Uh, can you speak about um, uh, the level of advocacy and organizing uh, families of the disappeared have been uh, engaging in, in Sri Lanka and uh, what has been the response of the state? What have been the experiences of the families in their quest for uh, uh, truth and accountability? Uh, uh, I think uh, different families have disappeared, have uh, at particular times formed themselves into groups, collectives, uh, movements, and uh, some of them have become very influential and very powerful. Uh, for example, I think in the uh, middle of 90s, uh, families of disappeared people from the majority ethnic community in Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese, were quite instrumental in having a change of government uh, after 17 years. And even right now, in the last few years, I think uh, families have disappeared from the ethnic minority Tamils have been a very strong uh, social movement. and. So I think uh, there has been particular times when they have organized themselves, uh, but there are also uh, different groups. Uh, they have differences among themselves, uh, but I think they still have something very common that all of them are trying to find out what happened to their loved ones. So they, some of them want uh, criminal accountability for those responsible. Some of them want reparations and uh, some of them are uh, very uh, committed and concerned about uh, broader issues, not just their family member, but more broadly about what happened to others. Uh, they're also more interested and committed in issues of democracy, rule of law and human rights uh, and ensuring that this uh, doesn't happen. And so they have been organizing protests, uh, often street protests, uh, like uh, on the 30th of August uh, yesterday or rather a few hours ago, uh, there were activities organized by families of disappeared people in different parts in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, many of them met with uh, uh, obstacles uh, from the state. Uh, I think uh, in one that I participated in, uh, in the eastern part of Sri Lanka, the police took out a court order trying to ban a march on the road uh, by families of disappeared people. Uh, but they defied it and they resisted and in the end they did what they wanted to do, they marched on the road. Uh, in other parts of Sri Lanka, in the north, for example, the, the police had uh, called uh, families of disappeared people and urged them uh, from not participating. Uh, they had discouraged them from participating. Then uh, in other parts, the, uh, the police had called organizers and host of events organized by families of disappeared people to question them about why they are doing it and uh, who, who is involved in it. So there has been a various you know, active, uh, intimidations, harassments when the families of disappeared tried to organize events uh, yesterday. And this has been the pattern uh, over the years. At particular times, it has been uh, much more intense uh, at, and more, much more hostile. Uh, at particular times, it has, the state has been less hostile. And I think there were particularly two moments when the state, uh, after the change of government in mid 90s, the state appointed presidential commissions of inquiries to look into uh, what had happened to people who uh, disappeared. And again, I think a few years ago, 
the the state of that time represented by the government at that time appointed a uh, special office uh, called office of missing persons to look into what happened to disappeared and it was a few years ago that sri lanka uh, ratified the international convention against enforced disappearances it was also around that time that uh, sri lanka brought in a law domestically uh, to criminalize uh, enforced disappearances so the state at particular times had uh, responded in different ways but overall the response has been very lukewarm uh, and sometimes uh, very very hostile and sometimes very uh, abusive towards uh, families of disappeared people uh, but families of disappeared themselves had continued their activities like i mentioned street protest uh, throughout uh, they have gone to courts uh, in many cases and there has been some significant achievements by uh, families of disappeared who had engaged with the judicial system in sri lanka Uh, although these have been the exceptions rather than the rule uh, they have engaged in publications uh, they have engaged in cultural activities uh, they have engaged themselves with the international community particularly with the uh, un officials with foreign diplomats uh, with international organizations and i think uh, in terms of uh, like activists like me who's uh, no not really part of those collectives directly uh, our role has been more to uh, try and accompany them uh, be present with them uh, sometimes uh, in protest be accompany them and be present when they are in courts uh, accompany and be present with them in international forums like at the un human rights council in geneva assist them sometimes in translations and interpretation assist them by introducing them to Uh, other influential figures like lawyers uh, diplomats uh, foreign journalists local journalists and uh, um, like uh, even like sometimes to do some fundraising uh, for example at the yester- for the yesterday's event we tried to collect some lunch packets uh, f- from among friends for families of disappeared who traveled very far to join in this protest uh, even some churches uh, helped to collect Uh, lunch packets for these families of disappeared people some churches also announced uh, in the sunday service that this event is happening and uh, so that more people could join so i think the the role of uh, uh, the activist and uh, sympathizers has also, also been very important to support uh, and to encourage families of disappeared people uh, in their struggles Well, you know thank you for you know sharing those experiences and also giving a sense of uh you know the initiatives that are you know currently underway um i you know i i do want to come back to um the level of organization of uh you know the families of the disappeared in sri lanka and ask you about a specific you know movement but before before we do that i i uh, do want to Uh, go to uh, Navkiran uh, so that she can also share um, her experiences and um, you know working with survivor families and uh, you know their um, efforts at both you know legal and other forms of accountability in Punjab. I know it, uh, in Navkiran's family's case, uh, it took well over a decade for this for them to be even um, of even you know basic level of accountability for uh, just one St. Cloud's abduction. So. um not getting if you can kind of speak to the, uh, the state of affairs of um of uh, families of the disappeared in punjab and uh, you know the nature of you know w- what those processes have looked like uh so thank you roki for sharing so much in detail and i do see some commonalities and things uh for punjab i would say uh, the time when we started uh when uh, my father was disappeared uh, and during the early 90s the thing was that uh, there were few human rights groups uh, who were actually allowed in punjab uh, to come document uh, or they were doing it uh, in uh, in total uh, secrecy uh, and uh, try to document and uh, highlight the issue but whoever was doing it was still more like uh, people would come document and then just move on so the families uh, had no uh, nowhere to go uh, to seek for justice and that's what my father kind of uh, understood the pain point of the families and uh, he uh, actually took up the responsibility uh, saying that uh, he was the one who was approaching the courts at that time and trying to uh, identify the families uh, from the list of the commission grounds and reaching out to the families and then uh, going uh, with them to file the the litigation on uh, the uh, the court cases and then even uh, 
asking the families to, if just in case they get harassed, uh, to actually uh, point the police officers who might come them uh, come to harass them to to him, uh, not to the families. But uh, in Punjab, at, even at that time, and even in some cases till today, uh, it was not just the government who criminal criminalized the victims, but even some parts of the society. Uh, which kind of uh, even criminalized the the victim families who who had lost their uh, loved ones, but uh, in any aspect, be it schools, be it banks, uh, be it uh, any other uh, institutions, uh, they were more uh, uh, kind of uh, given the impression that you des- your loved ones deserve to die and you deserve to suffer uh, even going forward. So uh, I think uh, the moment uh, this one thing, Kalada abduction happened, uh, this is something that Kalada family or the Kalada mission organization, which at that time was uh, formed as a Kalada action committee, uh, realized that we have to lead with an example for those families. Uh, it, uh, and Kalada case on its own had a lot of leverage. Uh, like uh, Imran mentioned uh, about uh, Jalil Andrabi, my father also traveled to Canada. So he had a lot of international uh, backup. Uh, he had uh, spoken up in uh, the ca- uh, Canadian parliamentary dinner uh, in which a lot of uh, Canadian MPs uh, participated. And then uh, he also traveled to UK, uh, England, and Austria. So so a lot of uh, international pressure was built around this one thing, Kalara. And this was an opportunity for us to actually make sure that the other cases also get through. Uh, The uh, other uh, uh, disappearances should also be heard about. But overall, uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, how the families have been, uh, in in very few cases, we could say that uh, the families were able to uh, reach out to the courts and and go for justice. But uh, from the state side, uh, there has never been any acknowledgement of the issue uh, and uh, also no uh, no such truth commission. I think there was once an initiative to uh, set up an independent commission uh, for uh, recording or uh, documenting these cases, but nothing went through as the government uh, kind of uh, uh, banned all these kind of effort, efforts. There are a few organizations uh, uh, like in SAAP and the Punjab disappeared and maybe few independent lawyers who have done work in the field and tried to document. But in terms of uh, some kind of a justice, uh, there hasn't been anything much done. Uh, very few cases, uh, including this one thing, Kalara, which took 16 years just uh, in the CBI courts. And then from 1995 to 2012, that's when uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions came. So, uh, but in terms of other families, uh, I think uh, uh, it kind of took time uh, for them to even uh, realize that uh, it's not them who are the uh, culprits. They are the victims and they need to stand up for their rights. Uh, But I guess with time, it was too late. We have lost many uh, families, uh, many victims who were old uh, due to old age or due to other reasons. And uh, we are kind of losing uh, those uh, eyewitnesses uh, or people who could actually stand up for those rights. Thank you. Um, you know, Imran, I, I definitely w- would like you to, you know, sh- share your perspectives as well. But I wanted to ask you a slightly different perspe- uh, a question regarding disappearances. Um, why do you believe uh, the state um, employs this particular method um, of perpetrating human rights violations? I mean, the state is often um, characterizing its activities as, uh, you know, counterinsurgencies, as, um, uh, you know, counterterrorist operations, as military operations. Um, but what they, they uh, seem enamored with this particular practice of uh, enforced disappearances. And what do you think is the, you know, purpose, uh, you know, behind that? Yeah, that's interesting, mm-hmm. one. Okay, so I'm going to start and tell you first a little bit about um, some of the main activists around this in Kashmir and then kind of come back to this question. So there's one organization that is the primary organization for the disappeared in Kashmir. It's called the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. And it's led by a woman by the name of Ravina and Hunger. Hunger. They've been working for many years. Uh, One of the main things that they do is try to remember, memorialize those who have been lost. And 
Mevkiran talked about this a little bit, but we're talking about in Kashmir in terms of documented cases in the 90s, we're talking about 10,000, about 10,000 people. And um, when you think about what the state is after, you know, part of this is just because they can't. They have the, they're allowed to do it. They have the power and there's nothing that prevents them from doing so, completely unaccountable. But part of it also is about the denial of many things, but most importantly, the denial of reality. And what the denial of reality allows is the manufacturing of alternate realities that then become sort of these conversations that you have to address. And so Nev Kern's describing a phenomenon where you have people who don't even recognize for a period that they're victims. And this, these are very pernicious phenomena and they happen because they can. And what they do is they create an incredible sense of insecurity and hopelessness. And so I think I would come back to sort of this idea of what you're denying in these families is an acknowledgement even of the fact of their loved one that they are gone. And what that means to these families is unaccountable. So the people that are typically affected, at least in the Kashmir context, are women, mothers, wives, sisters, and children. It's most typically the orphaned of those who were disappeared. And I don't know about the context in Punjab, but in Kashmir, by and large, the people that disappeared are young men who are engaged proactively on behalf of their families and in the community trying to do, make things that are, make positive change in a very difficult circumstance. These are critical people in these people's lives. And what you see happen is that you have women in the society who are already more, more vulnerable than others now dealing with all of those social problems with no acknowledgement of their reality, the trauma of their experience and the amplification of this state of radical insecurity, marginalization, economic insecurity, the rest of it. And you have children who grow up with this entire experience, their whole life is defined by trauma. I mean, I, I can't speak to another Karen's experience, but this, this trauma is, it's, it, well, I talked before about inheritance. This is their inheritance. Their primary immediate inheritance is this phenomenon together with everything else that it brought, including economic security, a struggle to get educated, make a difference, et cetera. You grow up with this. You, you're, the people that are critical for your life are not even, their existence and now their, their disappearance is not even acknowledged. It's a very pernicious, profound thing. And I think it goes primarily to the state's capacity uh, at least in the case of Kashmir, to do literally whatever it wants. And it's completely unaccountable. And I think this is one of the critical things to understand about Kashmir that might be different than other places. I mean, I think it is different than most, is that Kashmir is a place of total impunity, total impunity. There is no accountability. There has never been, there has not been a single case successfully brought for any violation in Kashmir. And if you look at the violations that have occurred in Kashmir, we're talking about the atrocity crimes that have occurred rampantly. You know, we're talking about war crimes, crimes against humanity. We're talking about all the major human rights violations, rampant occurrence, and there's zero accountability. And so, you know, this is, if you think about what disappearance means in a context like that, and you think about the insecurity of people, what that tells you about the value of your life, what you can count on, what you should believe in, it has a profound effect on everything. So I hope that's responsive. Thank you. Um, it, it actually, um, I think uh, introduces an interesting comparison. Uh, um, even though these are three different you know, contexts, Punjab, Kashmir, Sri Lanka, um, uh, you know, there, are, there are a lot of parallels. And of, of course, one of the most you know, glaring is um, at the international level, um, the lack of scrutiny and accountability. I know Sri Lanka's uh, experiences uh, in that regard have been, um, you know, different. But again, we still have not seen any, you know, measurable, you know, movement or progress. Uh, so bef before we ask Aruki to unpack um, that issue with respect to Sri Lanka, I'm uh, would love to hear your thoughts from Nufkirin and Imran about um, 
you know, you have a country like India where you, you know, mass, mass cremations were well documented uh, in Punjab. The Supreme Court even said that this is a flagrant violation uh, on a mass scale. So there's this undeniable record of mass cremations. In Kashmir, um, well documented uh, mass graves. So widespread systematic gross human rights violations, crimes against humanity, other atrocity crimes. Um, why has India been able to escape international censure? Um, you know, you know, for crimes that would e easily satisfy uh, uh, the, the definitions of, of these most egregious uh, and internationally recognized crimes. Um, you, uh, Navkiran, uh, uh, you know, um, if, if you're able to kind of respond to that first. I think, uh, I mean, as it's clear, like international response comes with some kind of a uh, either benefit or something that the other countries are looking for. Uh, the the way India is positioned right now uh, for all the uh, uh, tech world or economic uh, development or anything. So I think that's one reason. I mean, definitely we would love to have some kind of international response to these things, uh, but we haven't seen that uh, in, in terms of any of the conflicts. It's not just Punjab and Kashmir. Uh, it's even in the uh, indigenous people, the Naxalite movement, everywhere in, in, in India. We haven't seen any international response as of yet. Uh, even And then I, 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 I don't I mean, it's, it's not that it's uh, not out, like even in diaspora, people from all other communities have been raising the voice, but I guess it's just the power, uh, as Adhan just said, they have a power, they can do this and uh, nothing sticks to them. So uh, so I would say, I mean, on it, uh, the families or uh, families of disappeared do want it, but uh, it's, it's a bigger game that's involved up there. Uh Imran, if you could respond to that. Yeah, so um, I think I'm going to pick up on a couple of things that Nubkaran mentioned. Um, but maybe I'll start slightly differently, which is if you think about the system that you're describing, Sukman, it is a system of states. And in a system of states that's constructed by states, states are privileged and they're privileged by by concepts and doctrines like state sovereignty. And part of what that concept says is, yes, there might be things that we call, we, we talked about just now, atrocity crimes, or other things that are you know, universal human rights obligations, et cetera, that are both universal and fundamental, at least conceptually. But those things also do not pierce sovereignty. And the way sovereignty works, I mean, the way that India operates, India as a nation state, and Navkan rightly said, you know, it's not unique to either Punjab or Kashmir, but the way India operates is to uh, provide a very good display of compliance internationally with actual avoidance of everything. And you can see this through so many ways, but, you know, very simple, a very simple thing. I, I talked about, we talked about, you know, these very, you know, disappearance, extrajudicial killing, et cetera. You mentioned mass graves. You know, there, there's a clear record of crimes that are war crimes and crimes against humanity that have that have happened at scale. You know, massive, massive crimes. And the mechanism that exists in the world today, which is relatively recent, to deal with that, where a state in its sovereignty is not willing to deal with it itself, is the International Criminal Court. That's what it's there for. India chooses not to allow the jurisdiction of that court. Therefore, no Indian citizen, as a consequence of the limitation of the ICC, that venue itself, will ever be brought before the ICC. And so when you have total impunity in India, coupled with international impunity, it's total impunity. There's one other mechanism by which the ICC can assert jurisdiction. And that is if the UN Security Council recommends that the ICC assert jurisdiction. And I can tell you from 73 years of experience at the UN Security Council in the case of Kashmir, that the UN Security Council will not bring India to account for anything. And so, you know, this, 
this situation of you know unaccountability has that realistic legal dimension. So I think we should recognize that law operates to further violations as much as we seek to use law to call you know bring accountability it actually what i'm what i just described is the way that the international legal system actually works and it's this is sanctioned this is what it's supposed to be doing um there was one other thing that i wanted to mention um that you that your question raised um oh yes and the current references which is how does this operate you know otherwise we we also recognize all of us that you know, law is not a phenomenon that is separate from politics. I mean, everything, the operation of things has to do with the power that people can exercise. And there's various forms of power and very, various ways to exercise. What's interesting about India, particularly, is that India has been uh, both able to market itself broadly as a moral force in the world. The classic statement that we always hear is, India is the world's largest democracy. And we can talk about you know, why that is a very problematic, you know, moniker or brand and how, or how it just lacks any real content. But that India markets that and the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world at least is very willing to accept that happily. So there's a couple things going on there at least. One is that it's in the interest of every other state for states to have sovereignty, right? They have that own interest. They're gonna promote in other states. They don't want accountability. Nobody wants accountability from a state point of view. The second thing is India serves a purpose for other states. I'll give you an example. I'm an American citizen. If you look at contemporary American foreign policy debates, people are obsessed with China as a threat. Who is the moral counterpoint to China? It is secular, democratic India. Not only that, but India is a major market. 1.3 plus billion people. This is the future of our export capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is extremely difficult. I just described the law, now I'm talking more purely politics. When you think about the way that India is situated, both of its own doing, but also how the system works and how other states operate with India, there is no path. There is no practical path in the current frame. You have to change the dynamic in some way. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, a a path uh, might be identifiable through the experiences of Sri Lanka. Um, and I would like to ask uh, Ruki to, you know, unpack a little bit um, what, what happened within uh, Sri Lanka domestically and even internationally at the close of the war in 2009. Uh, there seemed to be um, international consensus and pressure to investigate um, you know, war crimes and human rights violations uh, from at least from the tail end of uh, uh, the last phase of the of the conflict. Um, and it seemed like and, you know, I know the the UN uh, uh, Office of High Commission for Human Rights appointed an, an investigating uh, body and they kind of came up with a, a, a pretty significant report. Um, and there seemed to be some appetite for an international tribunal, um, which didn't materialize. Can you uh, explain kind of what happened, what the state of uh, uh, the potential is for uh, a hybrid tribunal or an international tribunal? Uh, okay, so a few uh, maybe clarifications also yes, in terms of what you said. No, uh, a, the war ended in 2009 in Sri Lanka, May 2009. And ever since then, there has been widespread allegations of uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, and even genocide. And uh, enforced disappearances uh, have been a significant part of those allegations. Uh, although you know, there were other allegations like sexual violence, a uh, uh, lot of uh, extrajudicial executions and killings, uh, etc., and mass displacement uh, as well. So enforced disappearances was uh, one major part of these violations, not the only one. So the UN Human Rights Council, uh, which consists of uh, 47 countries represented by their governments uh, at particular times, uh, in 2014 appointed an international investigation. So it's not OSCHR, but it's the UN Human Rights Council. And that uh, happened because the majority of those 47 member countries uh, were willing to support it. And this was after many, many uh, years of lobbying. And I must also explain that uh, Western countries is only eight uh, out of that 47. 
uh, and uh, another, I think about seven are from Eastern European states. And the vast majority, uh, 13 from Africa, 13 from Asia, and eight from uh, Latin American countries. So it's simply not impossible uh, for a group of Western nations to uh, make a major decision at the UN Human Rights Council, like the appointment of an international investigation. So in the case of Sri Lanka, I think uh, like some of us, uh, including myself and uh, other activists realize this. And we also tried to uh, expand our lobbying to include non-Western countries. Uh, so I think that is what happened in 2014 when 23 countries uh, with uh, 12 abstentions and 12 against it uh, voted for a uh, international investigation on allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think that's very important to mention that it was an intergovernmental decision, not a, so it was basically a political decision. You know, 23 countries uh, decided, uh, took a political decision uh, to have an international investigation on uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, and the Western countries were just a small part of that. No, I, I think it was very significant that many uh, Latin American countries, some African countries supported that decision. Uh, it is also significant that a very few Asian countries uh, supported that decision, but also a few Asian countries abstained from the decision. Abstaining from the decision means that they didn't oppose it. So politically speaking, that was also important. Uh, countries like, I think, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines actually abstained from my memory so quite some time ago. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Human Rights Council asked the OSCHR to do the investigation. So OSCHR was implementing a decision by the UN Human Rights Council, and they found uh, credible allegations of uh, you know, war crimes, crimes against humanity. But these were just you know, credible allegations, and they went to great pains to explain that this was a human rights investigation and not a criminal investigation. Uh, and they recommended uh, uh, that this should be taken forward and those responsible should be uh, prosecuted after a proper criminal investigation. And that uh, prosecution has not happened. But what happened in the interim is that the Sri Lankan government in 2015, uh, uh, the, there was a new government in 2015, they agreed to set up a judicial mechanism with foreign involvement, along with an office of missing persons. Uh, the office of missing persons was set up by an act of parliament, uh, but the special judicial system with foreign involvement was never set up, and there was not even legislation passed to set it up. Uh, the government that promised it simply sat on it for like four years uh, without really pursuing it, and at certain times the president, the prime minister, ministers uh, said in public that they will never go ahead with that uh, uh, hybrid mechanism of, uh, uh, of a judicial mechanism with foreign involvement. Uh, but what happened interestingly in the meantime is that the domestic judici courts, the judiciary, uh, led by uh, some significant investigations by a branch of the police, uh, went ahead with a few cases. And I must emphasize that it's really, really very, very few. Uh, but those few proceeded. And some uh, army intelligence persons, some very senior Navy officers uh, were arrested on allegations of uh, enforced disappearances. At that time, enforced disappearances is not a, not a crime in Sri Lanka, uh, but they were still uh, arrested. And now they are being prosecuted. Uh, they have been charged uh, in uh, higher courts. So now they are accused. Uh, so it has proceeded to some extent. But what has happened since then, uh, rather unfortunately, is that the, the government very recently elected, like a few last November and more, the president elected last November and the parliament that was elected uh, just like a few weeks ago, earlier this month, has made pronouncements that uh, they are not very keen on it. Uh, and in fact, a uh, very senior police officer who was instrumental uh, in these investigations has been uh, persecuted and has been arrested on uh, different charges, which we believe, which many people believe, including some families have disappeared, uh, that this policeman is being uh, persecuted for his work on investigating enforced disappearances and helping to bring some errant uh, military officials uh, in front of the courts. Uh, so while the international process was going on, this also happened in the domestic courts. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, uncertainty, there's a lot of uh, suspicion and fear that uh, whether this uh, the, the, the kind of the progress we've seen in the last few years will actually go forward to ensure convictions of those uh, actually responsible. And also whether those who are really, really responsible at the highest level will be held accountable, or it'll be just middle level or low level people who will be held accountable, if at all someone will be held uh, accountable. So the, the, you mentioned about the international tribunal. Uh, I think there has been hardly any uh, movement towards an international tribunal. Uh, for example, like uh, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, 
I think there has been no movement towards anything like that in relation to Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka is not a party to the uh, the Rome Statute, so it's very, very unlikely and almost impossible, I think, that uh, Sri Lanka will be referred to the International Criminal Court. Although some families of disappeared people, uh, survivors and other victims' families have demanded that Sri Lanka be referred to the ICC uh, through the Security Council, but it, the prospects for that looks uh, very, very uh, bleak. The prospects for Sri Lanka being continuing to be on the agenda of the UN Human Rights Council uh, also looks very, very bleak. Uh, but so I think uh, we must uh, be uh, kind of uh, you know, open to the idea that the international dynamics change, international politics change. Uh, in 2014, there was some uh, significant uh, positive decision in terms of appointing an international investigation on Sri Lanka uh, by governments who were, majority of the governments who were member of the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, but at uh, other times, before that, after that, uh, there has been no such uh, positive uh, dynamics. Uh, but at the same time, I think the state is also not always the same. The, the nature of the state changes, particularly when governments change. And I think we've seen this in Sri Lanka, like I said, in 2015. We saw that also in the mid-90s in Sri Lanka, when there was more sympathy, more support uh, by a government that was elected in 1995 towards families of the disappeared, who were subjected to enforced disappearances by a previous government. And probably we've seen this in Latin American countries like Argentina, Guatemala, uh, Chile, where a change of government has uh, changed the landscape for uh, enforced disappearances, uh, where there was more sympathy, more support for families have disappeared uh, when uh, dictatorial governments were overturned uh, in Latin America. So that's why we've had very senior military officers being uh, prosecuted in some Latin American countries. Uh, we have uh, government sponsored uh, memorials and institutions set up in Latin American countries in favor of uh, families of disappeared people. Uh, but but even these changes, uh, whether it's at the international level or whether it's at the national level, often happens because of the courage uh, and the determination of families of disappeared people and a few people who uh, support them. So I think uh, what is at the heart of the struggle against enforced disappearances is the struggles by the families of disappeared people, uh, whether it is at international level or whether it's at domestic level. Well, you know, thank you for unpacking that and, um, you know, elucidating all the you know, you know, shifting tides, you know, both domestically and internationally. So just a couple of uh, follow up questions, if I may. Uh, so you, you mentioned that the, you know, there's, there's obviously a kind of uh, uh, a new government um, in power led by the Rajapaksas, um, who are widely regarded as, you know, kind of the, the chief architects of, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, gross human rights violations and crimes. Do you think that will create, renew or create another uh, opportunity or will there be a, a renewed appetite among uh, the international community within uh, UN bodies to kind of now relook at uh, this, the state of um, you know, accountability and uh, uh, kind of continue off the mandate they had uh, or renew the mandate of uh, the, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to kind of revisit? Uh, um... Uh, I mean, I think it's uh, too early. And uh, so far, there has been no indication that uh, some foreign governments will be uh, able to you know, be more critical of the, the, the new elected president and the newly elected uh, government. Uh, after all, you know, they were elected with popular mandates. Uh, and I think the foreign governments, as always, have a political economic uh, interest in uh, pursuing relationships. Uh, concerns related to families of disappeared people, other survivors and victims' families of rights violations uh, come, I think, a distant uh, a second or not really even a second, maybe not even a third, no, fourth, fifth, sixth. No, they are very far behind, I think, in terms of priorities for uh, in terms of foreign relations. Uh, so it's a bit too uh, early to tell that. But we also have a situation where there are various uh, uh, officers, for example, the present army commander who is credibly accused of uh, you know, being involved in uh, enforced disappearances, particularly when many people surrendered to the army at the end of the war. He was the person in charge of the army at that particular, on, that particular, on those particular days and in that particular area. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult for uh, foreign governments to take a more principled position rather than a position based on economic political ties. 
Uh, but I hope uh, that will be the case. You know that they will rise to the challenge of being more principled and of acting more in favor of uh, families of disappeared people and acting more in favor of uh, being standing against enforced disappearances and and for human rights rather than uh, uh, political economic considerations. Thank you. Um, I know we're getting uh, kind of close on the allotted time. A, a lot of questions uh, kind of have come in uh, during the course of this discussion. But before I uh, turn to you know questions from the audience, I did want to give a chance to the panelists to uh, speak to each other. And if there are any questions that um, either of you have for each other, um, you know, please please do uh, engage. Um, uh, but before I uh, you know. Uh, present some questions to you that have come in from the audience. You know, um, Ruki, I did have one more question actually. Uh, so during, during the, um, you know, process where, you know, the Human Rights Council was looking into allegations of war crimes and was determining, um, you know, what approach to take and then um, asking uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to kind of engage in this investigation. Um, uh, what role uh, did, did India play at all uh, in that process or subsequently? Was it supportive? Did it try to undermine it? Was it kind of, uh, you know, neutral on the matter? Um, is there any, uh, any light you can kind of, you know, shed on that angle? Uh, so in... Uh... 2009, uh, the UN Human Rights Council passed a resolution where it praised the Sri Lankan government at a special session of the Human Rights Council on Sri Lanka. And India was uh, one of those countries that you know, praised the Sri Lankan government in 2009 May. But in 2012 and 13, the Human Rights Council passed what I would call mildly critical uh, resolutions on Sri Lanka. And India was part of that resolution, both resolutions in 2012 and 13. And I think those are the resolutions that led to the 2014 resolution that uh, uh, no, led to the international investigation. But in that 2014 resolution, India abstained. Uh, but that is significant, I think. India didn't oppose it. No, so, so for me, I think it was a victory for human rights that, uh, uh, no, that India actually abstained. Of course, it would have been better if India supported it, uh, but actually India abstained. And it's quite significant because I think India has a a consistent position of uh, being against uh, country specific interventions by the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, so in that particular in that context, it was significant, I think, globally, not just for Sri Lanka, that India did not oppose and that India did not uh, side with the government in question, the Sri Lankan government at that particular time, but rather abstained. And I think possibly, uh, although India abstained, uh, they would have supported some other countries uh, at, to, uh, to vote for the resolution and support it. Because I think a lot of countries uh, would have uh, taken some guidance uh, from uh, India. India is after all, no, the, the, the big neighbor, the big powerful influential uh, neighbor of Sri Lanka, of small Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you for that, uh, you know, those insights. Um, I'm gonna turn to some questions from, uh, from the audience and this is, uh, you know, directed towards uh, each of the panelists. Um, and you, you did touch upon this uh, uh, during your comments, um, but if you could perhaps, uh, you know, unpack it a little bit more. Uh, the question is, um, what does uh, justice uh, look like for the families? What does truth, justice and reparations, you know, mean for the families? Um, and um, you know, I'll, I'll start with uh, Navgirin, uh, if you're able to kind of, uh, you know, relate to, to the context of, uh, you know, Punjab. I think uh, first thing is the acknowledgement of the impunity. Uh, and then uh, in Punjab, uh, most of the perpetrators are actually still in position, uh, either it's the police or even the political people are in power. Uh, the removal of those people, uh, a proper trial, uh, kind of a death census to be done because the problem with Punjab is uh, after just one thing's abduction, uh, the the work that he documented for mass cremation, it has been really hard uh, for other organizations to actually find uh, any uh, more evidences because it was mostly sealed uh, by the government. So, uh, so it it needs to open up. Uh, trials need to be done. I think most of the families uh, need need an answer 
to what happened and uh, accountability that we are looking for. Uh, and it's not uh, just the middlemen. It's not uh, those uh, officers uh, who might have been directly involved in disappearances or extrajudicial killings. Uh, it needs to be tracked back to the whole system that was operating uh, against uh, the minority community, the Sikh community at that time. And even now, I mean, uh, sometimes we, we look at Punjab as a past conflict. But the thing is, uh, the conflict is still ongoing. Uh, the new laws, the UAPA type of laws that are being used, even if in, in present day, we are seeing most of the youth are being uh, picked up from their houses just for a social media post. So those kind of things, uh, we need to, uh, I mean, uh, fair trials, that's what we uh, definitely want to look for. And in some cases, yes, compensation is also needed. Uh, Imran, if you could address that uh, question, uh, what does you know, truth, justice, and reparations uh, mean in the context of Kashmir? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, and I maybe I'll, I'll sort of speak to that and also kind of clarify. I mean, I, I look at this circumstance and see a circumstance where, you know, various families, I think Rookie mentioned this, I mean, various families are looking for various things, you know, kind of their, what, how far they want to go, what it means to them, uh, in my experience, is different. Ultimately, however, and I think Kashmir really brings this out, is that, like Navgaran just mentioned, substantive change, real change, changing that system that exists, that permits, and in, I think in a lot of ways, you know, not just facilitates, but actually is supportive of, in terms of the interests that are being served by what we call the state, is supportive of these phenomena. You know, these, these actually serve an agenda. So, that substantive change, and I and I don't mean to be cynical, you know, overly cynical about the mechanisms that are available. I think my point is more at, you know, you have to see the reality of this thing to fight that big fight and fight it together. Because to, from my vantage point, whether we're talking about Sri Lanka or we're talking about Punjab, we're talking about Kashmir, it's part of the same big fight. It has its particularities and has the, the situations of, you know, families and victims is very particular. That trauma is particular. These circumstances are particular, but the fight is essentially the same. So what does it mean? I mean, I think, um, as I said before, I mean, Kashmir is a situation of total impunity. Um, and so people know that there is no justice. They still fight cases, uh, however, or they did historically. Uh, and even those mechanisms are not available. I mean, I don't know if, you, if people follow the news, but, um, and this is not new, but kind of basic things which are foundational to any cognizable legal system like a right of habeas corpus doesn't exist in Kashmir has never existed in Kashmir. That is the right for those who are, that's a technical term, are, you know, is to produce a body, to actually show, uh, show the body of the person arrested before a judge. It's the minimum of due process that does not exist in Kashmir. And that is a matter of sanction. I mean, the courts in India and the law in India is, is actually designed to aid and abet impunity. And the situation in Kashmir illustrates that you know, very clearly. And so people don't look at the courts for justice. They look at the courts primarily in my experience to confront that system. Courts are a situs where we are engaged in a more fundamental struggle with the injustice and lies of the apparatus of power. And um, I think that starts in the case of the, the types of cases that we're talking about, which you know, are driven from the phenomenon of disappearance. And there's various ways that this manifests, but is, is trying to, in some sense, have an acknowledgement of the reality. You know, what I sort of described before is the denial of the existence, of the memory, of these facts, to have some acknowledgement, force the system in some way to acknowledge. And one of the interesting things that happened and there's so many things. I mean, and I, again, I don't know how, people, how much people follow the news, but I mean, the situation in Kashmir has been horrible, beyond horrible, my entire life. Since last year, that system got significantly worse. And one of the ways that it got worse is that even those venues that existed where you could at least even be heard, there's no accountability, there's no it's total impunity, but you could at least be heard, they've taken those away. So local administrative functions. So for example, there was in Kashmir for many years, a state human rights commission that couldn't do anything, but they would at least collect documents and keep a record 
of the violations that occurred to your family. Gone. And all the cases, the thousands of cases that had people had spent years building their cases at the State Human Rights Commission, they're all gone. It's just gone. There's no replacement. There's nothing that comes next. And so maybe there was a, this kind of reminds me, um, there's a case, so the phenomenon of disappearance in Kashmir is also attached to a, another phenomenon, which is fake encounter. The, 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 these sort of fake killings. I think it's true in the Punjab. I mean, it's true in other parts, in, in India, it's true. You sort of see, I mean, the current prime minister and home minister of India are directly implicated in those cases in Gujarat uh, years ago. Um, but one of these cases in, in 2010 in April, uh, the Indian military announced that they had um, captured three Pakistani terrorists in Kashmir and they showed the arms and they showed the weapons and all that kind of stuff. Around the same time, there were four men. This is in a, in a place in Kopwara called Macho. They, they sort of made this claim. And around the same time in, a, in neighboring villages, there were four men that were disappeared. The families pressed. There was popular civil disobedience as there was and has been in Kashmir. Pressure put, the bodies are exhumed. Turns out those three Pakistani militants are four day laborers from these villages who were abducted, disappeared, executed, and then the state announces them as Pakistani terrorists to validate their own agenda. In the aftermath of that, there was a kid who I know who, um, he was 17 years old. His name was Tafel Matu. He's walking back from his tutor. He's you know, visiting his tutor after school in Sirnagar and the military man fires a tear gas canister at his head and kills him. This is in May. Tafel Matu's father's name is Ashraf and Ashraf Matu has fought for justice, at least recognition of his son's killing since 2010, 10 years. And um, on the 10th death, death anniversary of his son in June, he said this thing um, in an interview that he gave that I thought kind of me speaks to this point, so fun. Um, and what he said was um, that he sometimes envied the people who had chose not to fight cases because most people don't fight cases in Kashmir. And he said that he envied them because the fighting of the, these cases in courts in some sense legitimates the courts. What he said is the, all the courts do is they shield the police. But he went on to say, and this is the part that I wanted to convey. He said, the judiciary is a fraud, but there's a fight and the fight is between truth and lies. And he said that the coming generations will know that they claim to be democratic. And I fought for 10 years. And he finished, he said, they lost and I won. And so for me, when I think about these things, I think about you know, the, the desire for accountability and how hard fought it is. Navrakan, you mentioned you know, 16 years, you fight these battles. In the case of Kashmir, there's no victory. There won't be a victory for anybody. But you fight. And I think what I'm getting at is not that it's hopeless, but that it's essential. That this endeavor for the truth, it's deeply personal in certain cases, but it affects all of us. The permissibility that these things happen and are unaccounted for. It says something very profound about the reality that we all live in. It's something that affects all of us and all of us need to be combating it and combating it together. And the experience of Sri Lanka or Punjab or Kashmir helps illuminate for us, elucidate for us things that otherwise go unrecognized, they go unmasked. There's real violence that's being done to bodies. We're talking about that, I'm sitting in the United States, you know, in the US today, this Black Lives Matter conversation is a, is a similar conversation. It's related to the same thing. Are we willing to recognize and address truths or will we allow lies, the lies that are told and serve the interests of the people that they serve to be perpetuated? 
And uh, in my view, you know, this is, that is the basis of our solidarity mutually to fight together for truth. You know, you know thank you for highlighting that. And I, um, I think, you know, one of the salient points that you're making is that, you know, the process is part of the punishment. In addition to these bodies being brutalized and disappeared, um, uh, survivors and victims are also dragged through the uh, courts. Um, but that experience in and of itself is a form of human rights documentation to show the total inefficacy um, of, uh, uh, of the courts and uh, establish that in fact, um, you know, there is no redress and which, which then, you know, uh, speaks to the question, you know, can, 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 can these rights actually exist where there is no possibility of a remedy? Um, which is, uh, you know, one of the core components to, you know, determining and testing whether or not uh, human rights exist is if there is, if remedies are available when they are in fact, uh, you know, violated and certainly in the context of, um, you know, Punjab and Kashmir, I think uh, survivors and victim families have amply, de amply demonstrated, you know, that uh, remedies um, on a wholesale basis are, are extremely elusive and non-existent. Um, Ruki, I certainly did uh, want to get your um, thoughts on, you know, the meaning of justice and reparations to families. And I wanted to know if you could also speak to issues of um, structural, uh, you know, biases. Um, and if those types of issues have come up in uh, communities and survivors demands, you know, for for change, um, and in their uh, discussion around uh, uh, reparations, um, you know, if that exists, and you know, what is what are what are the forms of uh, uh, structural biases? And how have, you know, communities asked for those to be addressed? Uh, so I think there has been an ethnic uh, bias uh, in Sri Lanka in terms of enforced disappearances. There's been large numbers of people who disappeared, I think, mostly in the late 80s uh, from the majority ethnic community, the Sinhalese. And since the 90s, there has been large numbers of uh, Tamils who have disappeared till about uh, 2010, uh, around the days of the end of the war and even afterwards. Uh, so in many situations, we've heard that uh, looking when uh, Tamil families have disappeared, uh, look for uh, their loved ones, uh, then uh, that is it's, uh, kind of perceived as a terrorist activity. So I think there is a kind of a societal bias in that and sometimes there's even a judicial bias in that. Uh, even like yesterday, uh, the 30th of August, uh, when the police took out a court order, uh, against families that disappeared uh, in the eastern province in Sri Lanka. One of the reasons given by the police was that this uh, protest march by the families of disappeared might uh, result in the or contribute towards the resurgence of the LTTE, whereas it has absolutely no connection uh, with the LTTE. So there is a, this kind of a bias in the state, and that is also very much there uh, in society, not just in the state. Uh, but coming back to the idea of what uh, you know, justice looks like. Uh, I think first and foremost, families have disappeared want to know whether their loved ones are alive or dead. And it's not just a yes or no uh, response that they expect. Uh, if they are alive, they would like to see uh, the person, meet the person, uh, even if they are held in some detention facility. And if they are dead, they would like to know uh, the details of the death, how they died, when they died, where they died, and if possible, get access to uh, some of the remains so that some rituals uh, or cultural uh, practices can be uh, performed. Uh, so that is, I think, uh, uh, the, the foremost thing that most families have disappeared want. The second thing I think that um, many families have disappeared, probably not all, want in Sri Lanka in my experiences is some form of reparations. And these are often financial and material. And I think there is a very practical side to it. Uh, so I've met many parents, particularly mothers in Sri Lanka, searching for their son or daughter who had disappeared, but they also have other children. So they need to take care of while they are you know, joining protests, while they are lobbying, engaging in advocacy activities. Uh, they also need to look after, feed, educate their other children who are still alive. And they have to protect the other children who are alive. Uh, and so they need uh, like, so the economic justice and economic empowerment uh, for that. So material financial support, I think is quite uh, crucial. And many families have disappeared expect that. And a third thing is that some families have disappeared uh, 
expect is criminal accountability, holding people responsible, accountable legally uh, through a judicial process, whether it's domestic and some want it, that process to be international because they don't have much faith in the domestic judicial system or the domestic uh, rule of law. Uh, and the last part that some families have disappeared uh, want to look out for is that this will not happen again. You know, so some are able to uh, kind of broaden their horizons to look beyond themselves and their family and think that this should never happen to anyone else, although it has uh, happened to them. So I think these kind of correspond to the theoretical conceptual uh, pillars of transitional justice, uh, you know, the four pillars of transitional justice. But I think there is one other thing that families have disappeared really, really look for. And I think that is solidarity. Uh, from uh, uh, other families have disappeared, uh, from uh, media, from artists, from professionals like lawyers, from religious leaders, from politicians, from uh, uh, UN officials, uh, diplomats, uh, etc., from across the board. I think that is very, very uh, crucial and not always forthcoming. No, and I think the solidarity can be also looked at in like two dimensions. No, one is at a very macro level, where people advocating and supporting uh, structural changes, like criminalizing enforced disappearances in a country uh, as a law, like setting up institutions, special institutions, to look for the disappeared people, or it could be a judicial or non-judicial. Uh, so these are more like structural things, uh, more at a macro level. Uh, but uh, families of disappeared also look at uh, solidarity at a micro level for themselves. No, so to, uh, I think I think I mentioned that at the beginning. No, so to, for people to be there, to be present and to accompany them when they go to courts, to visit them in their houses, uh, to be with them when they are holding a vigil, even with a few people. So to accompany them to meet a diplomat or a journalist, uh, help them in practical things like uh, translation. So I think this, uh, the idea of solidarity at a micro level, like individually, but for each family is really, really very important. And I think the challenge of this is for this solidarity to be consistent. Uh, because often, even me as an activist, sometimes I communicate with one family very regularly, several times a week for a couple of months. And then I don't communicate with that family for several months. And this has happened to me uh, because I also get engrossed with other things. I get engrossed with people who are displaced and evicted from their lands. I get engrossed with uh, survivors of torture or you know, some other. Uh, issues and then I kind of uh, ignore the families of disappeared that I had uh, close connections with. So that consistency of uh, you know, uh, for, for many years or even decades of uh, accompaniment and presence uh, is I think a very uh, big challenge uh, for, for all of us as uh, activists but also as professionals, as lawyers, as artists, uh, as media personnel etc. And I think uh, enforced disappearances is a very personal tragedy. Uh, it is about what happened to your son or daughter or father or mother, uh, but at the same time is a legal issue. You know, it's uh, illegal uh, by any any law, domestic, often domestic laws, but certainly international law in any circumstances. And forced disappearances are illegal, so it has a legal dimension. It also has a political dimension. So, like I said before, uh, during certain times, uh, there are mass, uh, large numbers of enforced disappearances by the state. Uh, in, at other times, there isn't. Uh, in the same state, there isn't so many enforced disappearances. Uh, and this is true for Sri Lanka, this is true for many Latin American countries. So I think this is also a political issue. So how to, I think, to uh, look at and address enforced disappearances from all these dimensions, you know, to make it personal without forgetting the legal and the political, to look at the, recognize the politics uh, in it without losing sight of the fact that this is a deeply personal issue, uh, I think is a challenge. Right. You know, uh, you know, you know, thank you for your comments. And I think that um, uh, if, if all the panelists could bear with us for a few more minutes um, and, you know, I'll make this the last question and then I'll let everybody, um, uh, you know, make a, a share their closing thoughts. But um, I, I think Ruki, your comments lead well into this next question, which is, you know, what, um, you know, globally, um, what can civil society, what can individuals, what can um, diaspora communities be doing uh, to engage these issues and support this work. Um, and uh, Navkiran, if, if you don't mind kind of uh, responding to that first. I think uh, uh, it, one foremost important thing is forming alliance, like uh, what, whatever Ruki and even Imran mentioned, uh, of some of the cases, they're like so similar of what I've heard uh, from some of the victim families in Punjab, be it a human shield cases, be it uh, 
uh, fake encounters, uh, you know, killing. In Punjab, there have been ca cases where a person was, uh, with the same name or father's name matching was killed. The police got the award. Two years later, the actual person was killed, and then they got the award again. I mean, this whole data exists, but uh, I mean, there are so many parallels that we can draw within each uh, each other's uh, conflict that uh, and the struggles that we are uh, going through. But uh, it, the 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 way we want to uh, have solidarity should not be just when we are together on the same panel. Uh, it should be uh, beyond that. Uh, when we are not together, we should be talking and uh, educating our communities and even others about the conflicts that are ongoing and, and try to build uh, solidarity and, uh, and allyship uh, within different communities. I think uh, that's kind of needed uh, for, for even uh, Punjab to, to educate the uh, rest of the world uh, of what actually happened and even uh, that how we are still spending uh, a closure uh, on, on all those cases, uh, on all those uh, victims of police torture or state uh, impunity. Thank you. Uh, Imran, if you have any thoughts uh, on, on how um, globally, internationally, individual, civil society, uh, the diaspora can uh, support um, these movements. So for me, the first thing, and it kind of a lot of what I was saying today is seeing the reality clearly and not not being subject to a lot of the assumptions that we are often that are often conveyed to us that we should have about how things work. And I think kind of getting more deeply at the substance of what is happening. And I think that's that's the first piece for me, you know, establishing an understanding of the scale of the problem the enormity of the circumstance. And through that, we can see, you know, what it is that we're talking about? What do we need to do? And who are our allies? And I think oftentimes we are too particular, as I said before, in our outlook. And I think we tend not to see who our allies are. A simple example, you know, Navka and I are talking today about, and she just said, you know, there, there are a lot of these same things that are happening in these two places. There hasn't been a lot of, uh, mutuality as amongst Sikh activists and Kashmir activists. What's interesting about that is that from the Indian state standpoint, they look at us very similarly. There was a case, for example, that was in the news this past week of a gentleman who is on trial in Frankfurt for spying on Sikhs and Kashmiris in Germany. And there's many cases like this, right? He's working for raw Indian intelligence spying on these expatriate communities. And I, the point here that I wanna make is that it's always been somewhat fascinating to me that the state recognizes everyone as a threat and we don't recognize each other as allies. So th that's, that's one point. Uh, more practically uh, speaking, and I won't go to tactics because I think you know, we, can, we can sort of talk about tactics, but in terms of how we approach the development of tactics, what I would say is that if we can look at things and sort of see things fundamentally, I think it opens up a lot of space for creativity to think about things that people have tried in other contexts that we might have tried. You know, to your question, Sukhman Taruki, about, okay, you have at least the beginnings of some kind of at least nominal transitional justice type, you know, truth commission endeavor in, in Sri Lanka, something like that. Like, what can we learn from that, right? What can we learn from you know, the some successful case in the Punjab to bring at least some recognition of violations. You know, what can we learn? There's a question of just that mutual enterprise of trying to figure out what we can, you know, how what can we take from one context and look at another context, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a different space, which is as we as we reimagine, we see things in a comparative context, we see things more essentially, more fundamentally, what new spaces do we open up? One of the things, for example, in the Palestine context that's got a lot of press in recent years is this movement of BDS, right? They took that idea from the South African anti-apartheid movement, adopted it and adapted it for their purposes, the activists that are involved in that. What, how does that work? What does that mean? That's just one example of opening up the space to me and thinking differently about, you know, what other things can you do to bring recognition, to bring accountability, to put pressure on the lies that are told, to seek 
some accountability, some remedy, some justice, some reparations. And so coming to your immediate question, what do we do in the diaspora? I think we need to think about these things in these terms. I also think that, and I say this often to, to people that I work with, we are in a situation, in my estimation, of extreme privilege. And that is that we have the opportunity to see these truths for what they are. At the same time, we are not day-to-day -day subject to the violence. And Navikaran mentioned it. I mean, the things that we're talking about, they're happening in Kashmir now. It's not like it was, this isn't history, it's happening now. And I'm not actively subject to that. I have the space, the capacity, the time, I have the education, I have, the, I have everything to bring to bear, to actually knowing what I know, to do something about it. And I have allies, people, some who I already recognize, some who I've yet to recognize with whom I can work. And you can bring, there are all kinds of resources that are available to, to actually do things. And I, I, I think it starts from a recognition of the limitations of what we have been doing and reassessing that, being more creative, being more imaginative, seeing more possibilities for solidarity and growth, learning the limitations of what we've done and trying to you know, fight that big fight, that big fight for truth. Thank you. Uh, Ruki, I'll, I'll turn to you with uh, the, the same question of, you know, what, what could the international uh, community be doing? Uh, I'm not referring, of course, to, you know, governments, but more so civil society, uh, individuals and, uh, you know, the diaspora community. What would you like to uh, see them do that could be helpful and impact the situation of uh, impunity and uh, justice in uh, Sri Lanka? Uh, uh, I think for foreign governments, uh, including diplomatic representations within a particular country like uh, other foreign diplomats in Colombo, I think it's very important not to legitimize uh, alleged perpetrators uh, or not to justify uh, or not to, uh, to uh, undervalue the seriousness uh, of this problem and uh, the sufferings uh, of the families of disappeared. Sometimes for diplomats do that. They are happy to shake hands with the perpetrators for uh, just to keep military, uh, political, economic ties going. And I think uh, that is a very dangerous thing to do. But of course, there has been some times when uh, uh, foreign governments have expressed solidarity with families of disappeared. Uh, we've seen that in Sri Lanka. And I think that is uh, you know, uh, important and that should continue. But I think this legitimizing and justifying uh, perpetrators uh, is something that the foreign governments in particular, uh, even sometimes the UN, uh, must, not, uh, must try to avoid. Uh, and also, in, in, instead of that, I think the approach should be more of uh, 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 different forms of solidarity with uh, families of disappeared people. And sometimes it can be uh, symbolic. Uh, being there physically, even a diplomat or even official is physically there uh, with uh, families of disappeared, I think that means a lot. Uh, like on a day like the International Day for Victims of Enforced Disappearances, the UN General Assembly resolution specifically asks for the UN system, uh, not uh, just OSCHR, uh, the UN system as a whole to do activities uh, for this particular day. But uh, there's hardly anything uh, that I've heard of. Uh, and in Sri Lanka, we saw the resident coordinator attending an event uh, with families of uh, disappeared some time ago. She issued a statement uh, a couple of years ago. I think those were positive things. Uh, so I think that kind of thing must uh, happen more regularly, but I think one of uh, kinds of shows of solidarity uh, by the uh, foreign governments, intergovernmental bodies is uh, definitely not enough. Uh, a second thing I think is that uh, international groups, particularly international or NGOs, uh, diaspora groups, uh, must, ac academics, uh, journalists must also understand their limitations because I think they are often far removed uh, from the realities of uh, families of disappeared people. Uh, and I have interacted with families of disappeared people, with many international organizations, with diaspora groups, and I've seen the contradictions of the, their perspectives. So I think sometimes it's good to acknowledge that, uh, uh, that sometimes local fam families of disappeared people and local activists also who live uh, there on the ground uh, sometimes know better uh, than uh, people living outside. And to, and to give uh, respect for that. And I think that uh, sometimes doesn't always happen. And I think it's, thirdly, I think it's important for people who are 
no living abroad not to mislead uh, families of disappeared people and i have seen that happen in sri lanka for example the hopes that have been given by some internationals to uh, families of disappeared people that a uh, international that sri lanka could be taken to the international criminal court uh, so i think it's a is a nice slogan to say that we demand the sri lanka to be taken to the international criminal court but there is no real information about what that would mean at a personal level to a particular family of a disappeared person uh, whether how many families of disappeared people one two or three will actually be able to get information about their loved one from the international criminal court uh, or whether it is just for some you no know, overall structural justice uh, that will be served or even the the, the whether the likelihood of that happening Uh, how long that might take what are the first steps what are the second steps and what are the challenges that are likely to encounter so i think uh, you no know, misleading families of disappeared people is something that i think international groups uh, must be careful about and the the last one i think is you no know, i think the other you know my colleagues on the panel have also mentioned the importance of uh, alliances among families of disappeared people so in asia for example we have the asian federation against enforced disappearances they also had a panel discussion uh, last friday on uh, to mark the day uh, so i think there are such associations in uh, other parts of the world uh, at in, at a continental level at a, like a, at latin american level and asian level at least i don't know about other regions and i think that kind of a Uh, solidarity uh, and no alliances and networks is important and again i think the challenge is for these networks to be more uh, families of disappeared centered and less on academics or activists and there are always uh, possibilities that uh, activist academics who are well versed in international languages like english uh, will be are likely to participate more in panel discussions like today for example no so i think uh, i am more likely to be invited for something like this than a family of a disappeared person who can't uh, uh, speak english uh, so easily and fluently or even if we take families it's more likely that uh, families of disappeared who are more uh, form who have more formal education who have more Uh, access to uh, national international connections will be privileged rather than families of disappeared who are who don't have that uh, so i think these kind of a uh, class dynamics gender dynamics uh, all must be taken into consideration in alliance building and the last thing that i would say in terms of international alliances also i think in terms of particularly in terms of enforced disappearances uh, some degree of uh, international uh, alliances is i think important and i think is very important that these also be intercontinental in nature no uh, like me for example i've had a lot of contacts with asian uh, uh, groups uh, also in europe in the us but very little in that america of course there are practical considerations like distance and also particular language uh, but i think latin america is a region where you know there has been very strong struggles by families of disappeared people uh, of different generations and there has been also i think i understand from some progress and i think it's important to uh, you know build uh, alliances going beyond the the traditional uh, international lobbying targets of western countries i think we need to get used to the idea that we need to also lobby uh, states which are in our own region like in asia uh, in africa and particularly in latin america and in sri lanka i think like i mentioned before i think briefly one of the reasons that we were able to get a international investigation through the human rights council was because uh, uh, many latin american countries and a few asian african countries supported that and that only came about because of uh, long years of lobbying uh, you know i think i heard a lot of you know different call call to actions in there including uh, developing a more ethical response to how um civil society engages uh, survivor communities but also about um how there still is tremendous opportunity for more solidarity uh, for more uh dialogue and collective action um and i know we've gone well over time but i think um you know uh, uh we have uh, you know plenty to take back with us and hopefully this is just a, a beginning of a conversation between all the panelists uh, uh that participated in today and i hope that um we can find ways to coordinate and uh, engage in solidarity and support each other's respective work and uh movement and of course always uh as uh, you know rookie rightly pointed out um you know always centering um uh, survivor families and their voices um i'm going to close out now since we are so over time i want to thank uh, all the audience members who uh, have stayed with us i want to thank the incredible panelists you're all an inspiration i want to thank uh colorado mission organization and frontline defenders for um bringing us together for this uh, important conversation 
Um, and I also want to encourage um, everybody who listened in to find a way uh, to get involved in social justice movements, whether they're global or whether they're local. Um, the world is on fire right now. And we have to use our voices and our bodies and our time uh, to contribute. There is uh, uh, no time to be on the sidelines. Um, so pick your issue. There's no shortage of um, crises right in your own neighborhood. So um, thank you for this uh, privilege for participating uh, in this conversation. Um, and I you know, hope everybody uh, takes care and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.